Naveen Valrani. Born in India, grew up in Dubai, studied in the US, studied in the UK. How do you describe yourself as an entrepreneur? Well, it's, um, it's interesting when you say, how do I describe myself? Uh, most, most entrepreneurs, when you speak to them, they talk about how they're self-made. And I'm firmly of the belief that there is no such thing as a self-made man. There's always help along an entrepreneur's journey. And uh, that starts from very, very early ages with, with a mentor and continues for pretty much a lifetime. Uh, in my case, uh, I'm, you know, I'm fortunate enough to be born into a business family. My father, who was on stage just a few minutes ago, was a very early mentor and continues to be my mentor. And, uh, you know, I was born into the right family, had the right guidance, uh, followed by the right education. And uh, education is something I hold uh, very dear to my heart. So uh, that journey is, is very much continuing. So I would say if I, I, I would describe myself as an education entrepreneur if I had to use one, one phrase. So what excites you to get into new businesses? Because being, you're a non-technical educated guy. Your education is always in business, not into the technical industry. But majority of your business lines are technical, like the air conditioning part, the construction part. Uh, the facility management part, these are all with technical backgrounds. When you decide expansion, of course, your dad started some businesses, you have multiplied it uh, basically in the last uh, 15 years, one and a half decade, you have got them multiplied. How do you decide expansion when you're on the verge of doing it? So it depends, you know, across, across my journey. Early on, it was very much on, about return on investment. It was very, very financial driven. But as I entered my 40s, it was more about the impact that I create and will create in society. So you, you tend to, your, your goalposts change, your, your, your aims change. Uh, and when you enter a venture now, at least when I enter a venture, it's not only about the financial return, which is extremely important, but it's also about the social impact. So you're a Wharton student. I'm sure that has given you the vision of how you can multiply the business. You finished your Wharton education in probably 1993. And subsequently, you had a big stint of doing business with your dad's leadership. Your dad is uh, out of active leadership for the past, uh, since 2007, approximately. Yeah, so and my father is interesting. I mean, he, he stepped back from the day-to-day -day running of the group right. in 2007, only for the global financial crisis to follow immediately after. So he stepped back in and said, you know, let me make sure that you guys are uh, doing a good job. And then a but he's more successful than Narayan Murthy. Uh, uh, yeah, in, in, he in many ways, He stepped back and yes. Infosys went down further. <laughs> yeah, in, in my father's case, he stepped back, handed over to the second generation, which was uh, inculcated into the group since the, the 80s, uh, and did it very, very successfully. So it's one of the rare success stories in, in this region of a business being handed over so successfully to a second generation. So you are very passionate uh, about education. You always make sure that you are on the top of the education that you keep giving yourself. And around 2011, 2012 or 13, you got into an MBA program uh, after your full working experience with the group. And post that MBA from the London uh, business, uh, School of Business, after you finished that MBA, you got into a different pa parameter for expansion. You started uh, taking over companies, mergers and acquisitions. What was the differentiator between before that program and after that program? I think first and foremost, the London Business School MBA gave me a toolkit. It gave me a toolkit on, on how to do acquisitions, how to look at businesses, and how to truly value them. And valuation is a very, very subjective field. So once you know the art of valuation, I won't call it a science, you can really, really play it to your advantage to maximize financial returns. So I think the London Business School gave me that toolkit. And then this region is really ripe for uh, acquisitions because we don't have very developed public markets. So it means for private investors and for, for people willing to put money behind entrepreneurs, there are tremendous opportunities. You have been exposed to the developed market and the developing market, and you're operating out of Dubai. How has being operative from Dubai helped you in business? Oh, Dubai is just the most wonderful city in the world. Uh, I know Miss, Miss Manisha alluded to it earlier in the, in the discussion, but really, if you're living in this city, I do not see why you would want to live anywhere else in the world. How has the environment helped you in taking decisions? Well, first and foremost, it's the ease of doing business here. 
uh, it's just a very, very easy place to do business. And uh, more importantly, we have a leader that is such a visionary and with someone who is moving so quickly that if you don't move at his pace, or at least don't attempt to move at his pace, uh, you'll be left way, way behind. And that just is so exciting. How do you create benchmarks for your organization as the CEO of the group? Well, we have the usual, you know, we set KPIs to our, our profit center heads. Uh, we monitor them very, very closely. But benchmarks, are, I, I believe, you know, financial metrics are only part of the game. It really boils down to the culture that you create within an organization and the ability to lead and the ability to inspire. And I think that's really what takes organizations forwards. I, th I think too many organizations are too financially driven. You have got a workforce of more than 10,000 people. So how do you keep 10,000 people inspired? What is the success anecdote that you would like to share? Well, you know, I, uh, first and foremost, I, I, the 10,000 people, I, I look at it as 10,000 families. So what drives me to come to work every day is that the decisions I make impact 10,000 families. And that means a lot to me. You know, that, res that responsibility is a, is a big, big burden uh, and, very, very, uh, and something I take very, very seriously. How different do you manage your team compared to the other entrepreneurs in the industry? Well, that's a, that's a, you know, I try and not c compare myself with other entrepreneurs, but I, lo I look at myself as someone who loves to serve. Uh, and that's a re as a result of the readings I had very early on in my life. So Mahatma Gandhi was, uh, was and is one of my inspirations. And his whole philosophy in serving a nation is something that I, has rubbed off, me, rubbed off on me in terms of, of my organization and the way I look at it. All your business sectors are basically business to business. Recently, you have started venturing into business to customers, to consumers. What is the change that you see and what are the additional responsibilities? Well, first and foremost, uh, a business to consumer uh, model is one where every single human being is either a customer or is an influencer. So you have to act accordingly and you have to ensure that your organization acts accordingly. So it's a complete change of framework not only from a, a staffing perspective, but also from an investor perspective, because even the investors have to behave as ambassadors. And that's a very, very important mindset, and that's one, not one easy to shift when you've been in B2B businesses for 40 plus years. As a B2B businessman, as an entrepreneur, what are the value additions that you give to your customers? Uh, not, the, not the pricing and delivery on time and quality is great. What is the difference that you do which has helped you to grow? Retain the customer and add more customers through referral programs of your existing customers. What is the difference that you do to them for adding value? So value addition is, of course, the core of any entrepreneurial venture. Uh, but the, what, you know, the key, again, for entrepreneurial ventures is to go from that startup phase where you have early adopters and innovators as your customers to the majority of the population. And that scaling is never easy. And it depends a lot on the team you select, the kind of financing you have, uh, and your ability to scale. Uh, and that comes with a certain management ethos, uh, which is, which is this, this continuous drive to, to expand. What are the fund management policies of your group that you have brought in after you have taken reins of the, uh, of the activity? Well, uh, our group has always been very, very financially disciplined. Uh, and that's really the secret of our success. Because you can, you can want to create max, you know, maximum social impact. But that is absolutely pointless if the organization is not financially sustainable. Uh, so we've always been very, very financially disciplined. And that is really what has, has caused us and led us to grow with, with what Dubai has become. What was your strategy when the economic scenario really went bad in this part of the world? around the 2009 and 10 and 11. So that was an interesting time for us uh, because... Your expenses were the same and your, I'm sure the revenue must have dipped down. Yeah. How did you manage that situation? So uh, first and foremost, uh, we created what we called, we actually called it a war council. Uh, so we all, all the CEOs in the group, we all got together, we sat in a room and we said, okay, let's, let's see where our risks, risks are right now. And how do we mitigate those risks? And there were a number of strategies. Of course, uh, my father came back out, out uh, came back to becoming active, uh, and he led the way. Uh, and we were very, very much hands-on. But most importantly, is we had a very, very strong balance sheet. Uh, we had been through a crisis in the mid '80s where we did not have a strong balance sheet, uh, so we had learned. So when this crisis came along, we almost welcomed it with open arms and saw it as a massive opportunity 
uh, which it did turn out to be. In fact, Dubai turned around a lot quicker than almost anyone expected. Amongst your group companies, which is the most profitable company and how do you look at it in terms of expansion? So that's interesting. That varies. Uh, our engineering services side of our businesses are very, very profitable. Um, our logistics are very profitable. Um, our education is doing phenomenally well, our first venture. Uh, our printing and packaging is very, very done very well. Historically, our oil and gas services have done very well. So there's no real one sector that really dominates in terms of profitability. Um, but in terms of future expansion, our bets are on education. Uh, and that's really where you'll see a lot of our capital flowing into the what we call the Arcadia, the Arcadia schooling system. What are the plans for Arcadia and why do you plan to expand that faster than the other sectors? So, uh, first and foremost, the plans for Arcadia, we plan to educate uh, roughly about 3,000 students over the next four years. So, uh, there will be 3,000 students running through Arcadia schools. Uh, that's our immediate objective. Uh, why education? Uh, because we see the, the, the Dubai economy evolving, evolving from a construction and oil services economy to one that is a lot more retail and consumer oriented. We see continuous population growth and a continuous demand for high quality education. Uh, so that's really where we are really uh, putting, our, putting our bet on. Uh, and uh, Arcadia is just extremely exciting. We have something very, very unique. We opened the doors uh, you know, just last August. And in our first year, we've attracted over uh, 350 children. Uh, and we, have, you know, we are the most successful premium school, new premium school in Dubai. And that speaks volumes. And that's really because of the kind of offering we have. And it's just a very, very special place to be. How do you fine tune your decision making process in a growing organization like yours based on the political scenario and the economic scenario around this region? So in terms of decision-making process, what I believe is the most important is culture. You really have to instill a culture of openness and comfort so people can speak their minds. Does uh, it happen? Yeah, I, I actually believe it does. Uh, and you know, uh, as far as we're concerned, that culture stems from fairness. And you know, we had a chat yesterday. Uh, for us, equality in the workplace is extremely important. And this equality not only is equality ac across race, religion, caste, creed, but it's also equality among gender. Uh, and His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum leads by example in that front with the number of female ministers he has in his cabinet. And the Al Sharawi group is not far behind. 50% uh, of my direct reports are female, and I'm predominantly a, a construction services organization. What are your review mechanisms? Because it is said that for an entrepreneur, every review is a new view. Every situation needs to be reviewed. So do you have a pattern to review how your growth of the organization is happening? Yeah, we do have review meetings, uh, but it, what's very important, I was actually having a chat with my financial controller just last week, and I was explaining the entire team of accountants, that what I do not want to see is them driving things up the organization for approval. So, you know, there's, the margin is too low on this project, go to CEO for the approval. Uh, that's not the kind of organization we are. The kind of organization we are is we empower our business leaders to make decisions, to make mistakes, and then to come back and say, look, this was the process I went through in terms of thinking, and this is where I went wrong. And that's really what differentiates us and allows us to compete with organizations, not only in, in Dubai, but throughout the Middle East and throughout the world. So how is your feedback mechanism after a mistake is committed by a particular segment of your team? So uh, I had a session today with one of my business heads, uh, and she reached out to me uh, by WhatsApp and said, you know, do you have 20 minutes? Uh, and I was on my way to the gym, and I said, you know, I can meet you, meet you outside the gym. So she drove down, uh, and we had a cup of coffee in, in what was essentially a bar, but, uh, but it was just a casual chat. And she told me, look, I've made these mistakes. And I said, you know, what, what took you, you know, what, uh, what caused these decisions to be made? And she explained her logic, and I was really, I, I, I almost admired her, I did admire her, for the fact that she could speak about her mistakes. And that in itself for me was a huge, huge strength. So when people admit their mistakes and the reviews that I have with my direct reports, one of the questions I ask is, what, would, what do you say is your biggest weakness? If you had to do things again, what would you do differently? So I actually appreciate people who come out and are able to talk about their mistakes and their failures and their weaknesses, because that in itself is a tremendous strength.
नेटवर्क एटीन टीम वुड लाइक टू गिव अट आई वुड लाइक टू रिक्वेस्ट सुधा नटराजन लक्ष्मी लक्ष्मी थैंक यू